All right, let's talk about chapter 20, chapter 25, which is going to talk about, discuss the history of life on Earth. Um, <clears throat> so as I'm sure you're aware, the life that exists now on the planet is, um, it's the same as in the past, in terms of perhaps biochemistry, but in terms of the way things uh, look, they're clearly a lot different. Species, of course, have evolved through time. We don't have dinosaurs anymore, even though they once um, were very dominant on the planet. <clears throat> so, first, the first question is, where did the first living things come about? Well, of course, we have all sorts of uh, mythology that explains this, and different cultures and religions have different ways of explaining this, but we're going to stick to... Um, scientific explanations, and that is explanations that can be tested in some way, at least by the scientific method. Um, one of the most famous experiments was done by this guy, Stanley Miller, back in the 50s when he was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. He and his um, um, advisor, I can't think of his first name right now, but his last name was Yuri, they devised an apparatus to determine if the compounds that were presumably present on the early Earth, if you could take them and under the right conditions, get them to form the building blocks of life. And so they mixed these things together, heated them up, and provided some energy in the form of electric shock, condensed, cooled them down basically, condensed it, liquefied it, and then tested that liquid for the presence of organic compounds. And indeed, they did find amino acids present. Um, in their test, you can see there was about seven or eight. Subsequent tests have shown that you can actually generate more and you can generate larger ones. And so this was, a, again, an important experiment that showed that you could take simple compounds, inorganic compounds, and make larger organic molecules out of them under the right conditions. You'll notice, and keep this in mind, what's missing is free oxygen. That's sort of a key thing here. As far as we know, the early Earth was lacking free oxygen. There was oxygen present in carbon um, um, monoxide here and water, for example, but no free oxygen. Um, and so, when you start generating these organic compounds, so in addition to amino acids, you might also generate simple types of lipids, and of course from the amino acids you can make proteins. So, through the process of what we call abiogenesis, or the abiotic genesis of life, um, you start to generate things that begin to resemble living organisms, or protocells. You have the first protocells. And so when you have those lipids, for example, and they're in an aqueous solution, they s assemble into little balls, and so you have something that resembles a, a membrane. And then when you have um, um, molecules developing, say, for example, simple types of nucleic acids, RNA, RNAs can have enzymatic properties, and when they do, we call these ribozymes. So, when you begin to uh, assemble these things into these little vesicles, these little simple membrane structures, and in them, you begin to have collections of compounds that are um, perhaps different from the outside. They you begin to have something that resembles a cell. It begins to have sort of a primitive type of metabolism. And when that thing sort of can split into two, you begin to have a primitive type of reproduction. And so now you have something, again, that resembles 
a living thing, this this proto cell. Um, there's a lot of debate about where exactly this happened. Did it happen in surface waters? Did it happen deeper in the ocean? Um, there's ideas of it happening on particular surfaces. Um, clay surfaces can provide a uh, surface area over which these things can form at a greater rate than when they're not present. Um, so it's assumed that of course the early Earth had no life because of the structure of the Earth being this molten extremely hot mass but as it cooled you began to get the conditions that became favorable for this what we would say at first this chemical evolution that is you had going from simple compounds to more complex compounds the aggregation of certain of these chemical compounds into a structure that resembles a living thing and then over time uh, exhibiting the characteristics of life there would have been of course selection for combinations of compounds and structures that were more stable a lot of combinations probably didn't work and just broke apart they were basically selected against if you will but ultimately it would have le led to what we would call as the first living thing the first type of cell the first prokaryote <clears throat> now uh, when did this happen well we have to look at the fossil record to get evidence for this and you're familiar with fossils, the remains of these living things from the past. And so, oh, Dimetrodon, we're going to get to him in a second, one of my favorite of organisms of something from the past. We're going to see that we have to go back about three and a half billion years to see the first living thing. Oh, there's Dimetrodon. This um, organism from the past with this huge uh, fin or sail on its back that was thought to be used for regulating its temperature. Okay, now let's talk first about how do we figure out how old things are? Well, we use radiometric dating, and you're probably somewhat familiar with this. That is, you use radioactive isotopes and their half-life to figure out how old things are. So you can date rocks this way using types, certain types of uh, radioisotopes. You can date organic materials using radioactive carbon, for example. And so when you have um, something like C14, it's a radioactive isotope of carbon. And it has a half-life, if I remember correctly, of about 5,700 years. And so in a batch of carbon it'll have a certain amount of this but over time that C14 breaks down and is no longer present so you can look at the CO the ratio of C14 to C12 in that that material and if you have less of the C14 you know that it's older in fact if you have essentially half of the original amount it's about 5700 years old and this decay, this breakdown of these isotopes, happens at a constant rate. So the time to go from having the full amount to the half amount is one half life. From half to one quarter is a second half life. And that amount of time is the same amount. So we can use this technique to date things and figure out how old some of these oldest fossils are. And we can again look at these fossils and date them and use that these fossils the way they look their ages to essentially map out or figure out the history of life and how things have changed over time and how um, you know reptiles and dinosaurs gave rise to these organisms the synapsids synapsids which gave rise to our good friend dimetrodon and then this lineage that ultimately gave rise to mammals. <clears throat> so you would say we are extremely distant relatives to reptiles and dinosaurs and such, but we are not. And we're a more recent uh, ancestor to Dimetrodon, but Dimetrodon is basically just one of our cousins in the very distant past, and we are more closely related to these therapsids and sonodonts. Um, <clears throat> 
Okay, let's start section three and see how far we get. So, a little more details on the history of life. Um, so, here's this uh, image we have, this sort of some one described as the clock analogy. And so it shows some of the major events in the history of life. A little over four and a half billion years ago, of course, the solar system and the Earth forming. During the early stages of the Earth, again, the conditions were very harsh, and so a lifeless planet. But we had a biogenesis a little over about three and three quarters billion years ago, the first prokaryotes arising. And again, a long, and, and a long time of simply this uh, prokaryotic world. At some point, you know, a little over two and a half billion years ago, two and three, three quarters billion years ago, we had the development of photosynthesis and production of oxygen, eukaryotes, etc. We'll, we'll look at these here in detail in a moment. And you don't have to memorize this by any means, but this is out of the book, and it just shows again some of the major things that have occurred from, of course, the origins of the Earth, first life, first eukaryotes, increasing complexity and diversification of life, um, first tetrapods, um, and diversification of reptiles, amphibians. Um, First mammals appearing a long time ago, the dinosaurs dying out, mammals diversifying, and then of course the most recent time, people coming about. Just one thing I want you to notice is that on the right side, this is not to scale. On the left side you have the scale, so you can see during much of a good chunk of Earth's early history, it's what's known as the Archaean, and it's this bottom section right here and the Proterozoic covering this section right here. So these two down here, although they're sort of compressed below, you can see they cover a good chunk of Earth's history. Okay. So a lot of this other stuff is happening much more recently. Okay, oxygen. So some of these Prokaryotes begin making use of um, sunlight, carbon dioxide, water to make their own food, producing oxygen. So the amount of oxygen in the air began to increase um, and changing the atmosphere. And as we'll see, making something like the colonization of land possible, also making aerobic respiration possible. It wasn't before you had any atmospheric oxygen. Development of eukaryotes, another significant step. How did that happen? Through this process known as endosymbiosis, where we go from a prokaryotic, prokaryotic world, prokaryotes developing greater complexity, internal membrane structure, and we have some extant existing prokaryotes that are like this. Um, starting to um, segregate the genetic material into what you might call a simple type of nucleus, and then ultimately gaining uh, more complexity through the acquisition of organelles like the mitochondrion and the chloroplast through, again, endosymbiosis. So what happens is this um, prokaryote that is exhibiting more complex characteristics takes in another prokaryote that under, for most of them, they would have, perhaps that was a source of food, they would have digest that thing. But some of these prokaryotes had, um, they were mutants, if you will, they had genetic variants such that when they took in this other prokaryote, then instead of digesting it, it started living inside of it, became an endosymbiont. They were symbiotic, living together, one inside the other. And if this prokaryote that was taken in happened to be really good at aerobic respiration, then it could give this new um, uh, cell, this new organism, an advantage over others, and it would have been favored. I'm going to stop here, and we'll pick this up in the next video.